Um, okay, hi everybody, I can't really see you. I'm gonna assume there are thousands of you out there. Um, yeah, thank you, lots of noise, great. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm Jen Ellis, uh, I'm something at something at Rapid7. Um, and if you're here for an OSINT talk, you're gonna be really, really disappointed, so sorry. <laughs> uh, for anyone who doesn't know that that's switched in the agenda, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> instead, I'm gonna be talking about uh, uh, communication specifically around how you handle crisis situations. Um, this is a little awkward because I can't really see all of you, but uh, I really like audience participation, so I'm gonna ask some questions now. So a uh, quick show of hands, and hopefully, maybe they could just bring the lights down a little bit so I can see people, maybe, if there's somebody there. <laughs> who knows if there's somebody there? <laughs> God, can you hear me? All right, um, so, so a quick show of hands, maybe. Uh, how many people are involved with um, vulnerability, disclosure, and handling in some capacity? A few people? Is there any other way, Dave? Uh, uh, okay, um, if you were hit by ransomware, would you perhaps be involved in handling a situation like that? Show of hands, anybody? Okay, one or two. Um, if you had a, uh, a data breach of some kind, would you be involved perhaps in handling a situation, responding to a situation like that? Okay, a few of you, all right. So this talk then is for you. Um, so according to the prevailing wisdom in security, you are like 728% likely to be breached in the next five minutes. Um, oh, right, during this talk, by me, while I'm standing here. Um, or you're gonna get somebody who comes to you and says, hey, I found a vulnerability in your product. Basically, the, the point here is that you are headed towards a shitstorm at some point. It's gonna happen. You cannot escape it. That is the reality of working in security. Now you all question why you chose this career. Um, as security people, you probably tend to focus on things like how will you respond from a technical point of view? How quickly can you recover? What will that recovery look like? Who needs to be involved? Um, how do you not get fired? All that good stuff. And that is really important to know. But the communications piece is also really important. Uh, one, because it's a bit of a dark art. It's a, a little bit of uh, crazy voodoo. And two, because how you handle communications can make a pretty significant difference in terms of what the impact of the crisis is, whatever that crisis may be. So it can kind of make or break a bad situation. Um, so that's why I think it's important to talk about, I think it's important to prepare, and so that's why we're gonna talk about it today. And I'm gonna give you a minute just to appreciate that on the internet you really can find anything, including a cat ass trophy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the internet is a wonderful place. Uh, so we're gonna talk through five different things to do um, to avoid a, catas a catastrophe. Uh, and I'm gonna talk through them in a little bit more detail, so I'm not gonna read them out now because you guys have eyes and you can read. Um, so the first one, and I would say this is probably the biggie, is make a freaking plan. Um, preparation is hard. Everybody always you know, pushes it off to another day. And, and honestly, it's kind of a pain in the ass because the people you work with are really busy and trying to get them to pay attention to something that's a, a what if scenario can be hard. But preparation is key. You don't wanna be in a crisis trying to figure out who does what. You don't wanna be in a crisis trying to figure out what your processes should be. That's the worst possible time to do it, the time when everyone's running around like a chicken with no head and like you have no trust and everybody's feeling very pressured and defensive. So preparing is really critical. Um, I'm gonna take you through a couple of slides that will show you some ideas of how we approach this at Rapid7. It'll be different for everybody and these are gonna be like a bit of an eye chart so I'm, not, I'm gonna talk you through them, I'm not expecting you to read them. Um, but we started by defining responsibilities. So what you're looking at here is a RACI. How many people are familiar with RACI? Oh, no one, wow, uh, apart from Todd, shockingly. Uh, um, oh, I wonder who it is who makes you do RACIs, Todd. Um, so uh, a RACI model is uh, just a particular choice of uh, project management model that's around defining responsibilities and roles. Uh, RACI stands for Responsible, Accountable, Consulted, and Informed, which are the four different types of roles that we define in terms of how people participate. There are lots of different equivalents to RACI. You should Google different things that you can can use and find one that works for you. This just happens to work for us. So what we do is we look at various different scenarios of a possible type of crisis. 
we break them into their component parts and we look at all the core stakeholders, whoever those stakeholders may be, and then we define roles and responsibilities. And so as an example, this is actually something that was built by our head of security. When he sent it to me originally, firstly, I'll be honest, I didn't want to read it, I was busy. It seemed like kind of a time suck. Um, and that's bad, and that you're going to encounter that if you go through this process, but you're going to have to get past it and convince people that it is important and it's worth spending time on. When I looked at it, I had that moment where I realized why this is important and why we spend time on it, because it was wrong. And so I looked at it, and I was like, wait a second. Uh, since when is product marketing in charge of like the communications? Like, I'm in charge of communications. How very dare they? What are they thinking? And so then we had this like big conversation about... Well, the difference is between accountable and informing and consulting and all those different pieces, and we kind of tried to figure out who would be doing what in a situation. Like, the problem is, if we don't do that beforehand, if we wait until the moment to do it, when the shit has hit the fan and we're all running around like crazy, one of two things is going to happen. Either we're going to trip over each other and bash heads, it's going to be inefficient, we're going to have a much poorer work quality that comes out, or we're going to assume that the other person's got it, and we're not going to pick it up, and it's not going to get done. Either of those scenarios is bad news. So defining responsibilities and roles in advance and like really figuring out what those look like is key. And a really big part of this is getting to know the different stakeholders. If you guys work in security, there's probably a decent chance you don't know your marketing people super well. Quick show of hands, how many people know their marketing people well? Hey, Lance, how you doing? <laughs> uh, how many people know their GC very well? Their general counsel, legal team. Uh, HD is his own. Uh, um, okay, so these are people who, in any crisis scenario, are going to be integral to how you respond, particularly on the comm side. Go and meet them. Take them out for lunch. Take them for coffee. Learn what their priorities are and what their triggers are. Unless you work in a security company like I do, the chances are that they don't know very much about security. They don't know how to handle a security situation. So it's your job to help educate them on that. In turn, it's their job to educate you on what their concerns are in any scenario. Like, what are the legal considerations? What, what does liability look like? What are the comms situation? What, how do we manage reputation? Like, what does that look like if you're in their shoes? And learn up front what their concerns and considerations will be so that you know how you can manage them for them and they can manage yours in the same way. They can be sensitive to them. When I typically talk about this topic, I normally present with our head of security. And he and I work really, really closely together. Again, I work in a security company, so I have the luxury of that. But most people don't, and so you have to go the extra mile to build that relationship in advance and figure out who your core team is, who those core stakeholders will be in any situation, and how you will work together. And set expectations, which is where something like this comes in. And again, it's a complete eye chart. I'm not expecting you guys to be able to read it. But what we do is, again, taking scenarios that we've built, that we're trying to understand, we then figure out what a, what, a, what a workflow might look like. And obviously understanding that in any crisis situation, the reality is they change. They're adaptable, they're flexible. We have to be adaptable and flexible too. And so you can't get locked into something like this and not be able to move and be agile. But having a basic idea of what the expectation should be and setting them out in advance and doing a tabletop exercise, working through prep with people, actually you know, doing experiments to test how well these things work is invaluable to get you past the, like, trying to figure out in the heat of the moment and falling all over each other. So the second big thing is managing stakeholders. As soon as any situation arises, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be in a situation where you have to figure out who your core stakeholders are, how you're going to work together, how you're com going to communicate with each other. And then you may also find you have multiple layers of stakeholder groups. There's a microphone there. Um, so like, for example, uh, we had a situation recently where um, part of our service went down. And we had the core stakeholder group who were working on restoring the service and communicating with our customers. But then we also had a stakeholder group of execs who wanted to be kept informed. And so we had to have a plan of what communication with the execs looks like, what's an appropriate frequency, um, what's an appropriate mechanism, who owns that. 
so that you have one person who's like the person liaising with them. And then for us as the stakeholders who were working through the, the response, what was an appropriate cadence for check-ins? How are we gonna do that from a technological point of view? I've worked on scenarios in the past where we've been told no communication on email, everything off email. So like knowing what those situations look like and having a plan in advance so that you can have everybody's mobile numbers in case you can't do email or have everybody's personal email addresses in case you can't use the corporate email. Like thinking things like that through will save you a lot of time in the heat of the moment and will make it much smoother. And then like having an understanding of how you're gonna communicate as a team. And I will say the biggest thing that I would tell you for the stakeholder management there's a couple of things. One, are you guys familiar with the, the term of like make like a duck? So like glide smoothly on the surface while you're paddling like hell under the water. So I actually had a situation where, you know, I, I have a slight tendency to storm about the office looking very important um, in my head. And I had our CFO come, come up to me once and say, hey, like you're drawing a lot of attention. And when you like have these little meetings with you know, very important people in the company and you're all looking like you're talking about very important issues, other people start to notice. They're not stupid. They like pay attention to that and then they start speculating wildly. So you need to think about how you're communicating through your body language with the broader team and you need to think about how to manage that piece. That's one thing. Um, the second thing is it's really easy in any crisis situation to get into recriminations and it's really unhelpful. It is the worst thing you can do. After you've dealt with the situation, by all means, have a post-mortem. Investigate what happened, figure out what the learnings are and how you move forward. But do it because you're focused on learnings and capturing them and moving forward in a better way. Don't do it just to beat up on people. In the heat of the moment, the only reason you should ever be looking at what happened is so you can fix it and you can figure out what needs to be communicated and how. You should never be looking at what happened with a view of blame. That is the last thing you should do. So again, for, for, for this piece around stakeholders, make like a duck, avoid blame. Those are my two big things. So the third thing you really need to do is you need to be monitoring the situation. As I said, every crisis is changeable. And the more information you can get about what's going on and how it's changing, the better. Now this might sound really flipping obvious to you, um, and certainly this cat clearly knows what's, uh, what's up on this scale. But the reality is, it's actually hard to do. So I'll give you an example. Um, a friend of mine worked in a situation where she was representing a company that was a document storage company. They had a big fire in one of their warehouses. And in that situation, the, the papers that they'd been storing sort of went everywhere in the wind and there were like fragments of paper everywhere. And they had people like taking pictures of papers that they found down by the river and putting them on Instagram and that kind of thing, which actually has legal repercussions, repercussions has liability repercussions. So she had to do m social monitoring to understand what the scenario was, what was going on, find these pieces of paper that were being shared, get them taken down, make sure that the lawyers were aware of all of it. And she had to do that in a situation where Nobody was posting them referring to the company name. Like, she didn't, they didn't know what, what it was connected to. So it wasn't as simple as like just setting up a Google alert for the company name or like setting up a, you know, a Twitter filter. It, it, she had to do something much more like refined than that. Now, you're probably not the guys who are gonna be managing that process. Like, you'll have a comms team, hopefully, that you're working with, who'll be specialists, who'll know what they're doing. But you may be the people who think of it. You may be the people who say, hey, have we thought about this aspect? And, and it could be you know, something completely different to this, but like making sure that all those pieces get thought about, making sure that you're aware of what the internal team is saying, what they're hearing from the customers. Are they hearing questions? Are they getting worried? Like being aware of all of those pieces, you can help inform that process. And again, the more that you can collaborate with your comms team and help them with this, the more you value you can drive and the better outcomes you're likely to get to. Which brings us neatly to arming your internal team. Thundercats, oh. um, Your internal team is your front line. You need to respect that about them and you need to do everything you can to set them up for success. They're the people who are gonna get phone calls or emails from customers or prospects or people that have heard something in the community and they're not gonna know how to answer it. And you don't wanna have a lot of inconsistent information going out there, so you need to help arm them with the right information. In any given situation that we have, what did I just say about my internal team being like my... 
that's it, you're, sn you're schnarf now. You're designated as schnarf. Um, so in any, in any given situation that we have a Rapid7, we create an FAQ. And it's for internal use only, and we'll send it out. And sometimes we actually, this makes us sound crazy, but we sometimes have multiple FAQs, one of which is for the broad internal team so that they can know like the basics and they can know how to handle basic uh, questions on it. And then we'll have a more advanced one with like the dirtier, horrible questions that goes to just like the approved spokespeople so that they can all get on the same page. Like think about how you arm your internal team to be your front line, to be your ambassadors and your champions, but also think about how you reassure them because like nobody's as passionate about what you do as your fellow employees. So they're gonna get worried and scared and you need to help reassure them as much as possible so that they don't panic. So this is the piece that everybody always focuses on, is the public piece. And particularly people look at the press stuff. That's what everyone thinks about when they think about handling disclosure and communication. Um, and it is really an important piece. But as I hopefully have highlighted by going through the other four steps, it is not the be all and end all. It is not everything. It should be handled as part of a comprehensive strategy. And you really do need to get the internal piece done. Typically, when I consult with clients on crisis comms, which I do, um, they will be really focused on external communications. They won't have thought about internal at all. And if you don't get the internal piece right, then you will definitely fail at the external. Um, so with external, you need to think about all your different audiences, firstly, is the key thing. You might have regulators you need to work with. You may have partners that need to be notified. You may have competitors you need to notify if you're all using a similar technology for something and it's all affected. Um, and so you need to think about who those different people are and what the right mechanism and timeline is for communicating. And it's really tough sometimes to know what the right timeline is and how much information to give. We have definitely in situations in the past erred on the side of transparency, which may sound like, oh, aren't we great? Because we like really open with people and we tell them what's going on. But sometimes people will turn around and be like, why are you telling us this? Like, why are you bothering me? Or they'll actually feel like you're making them worried about something they don't need to be worried about. So you need to be selective with what you share and think about whether it's the right thing at the right time. But don't try and avoid it, right? So like, be authentic. When you go out publicly, you need to be you, you need to be authentic. Don't try and hide. Don't try and like, sort of obfuscate the, the truth of the matter. Like, be, be honest, but, but be honest wisely. Um, and over, overall, use as a guiding principle, like, what is the best thing for those who are affected? Like, that is your number one thing to think about. Yeah, this is my spirit animal. Um, but like really think about like how do you communicate in a way that is going to de-stress your customers and like help them as much as possible. So like are there things that you can do to make it really, really easy for them? Like can you take action on their behalf? Um, we did a vulnerability disclosure last year um, around uh, vulnerabilities in a Johnson & Johnson um, Animus One Touch Ping insulin pump. And we worked really, really closely with J&J &J to do the disclosure because we didn't want to panic people. Like, hey, if a hacker who had the right capabilities and the right motivation and the right access was like mindful to, they could potentially like really harm someone through this. But more, more worryingly, if people like just panicked and started ripping out their insulin pumps, that would definitely probably hurt people. So, definitely probably, my favorite phrase. Um, <laughs> so, like, we wanted to be very mindful of what the impact on the customers could be and make sure that they didn't start panicking and going crazy. So you need to really think about, like, how do you reassure people? How do you make it easy for them? What can you do to, like, make it, make it clean and make it less scary? Um, that's, that's the big focus. And then think about what your mechanisms are. So is it press? Is it social? Like, is it mail? When we did the J&J &J thing, they sent letters out. Who knew that was still a freaking thing? But it is, apparently. Um, so think about all the pieces that go together. Again, your comms people will know how to build a strategy around this, but they're not the experts in security. You guys are. So you need to help them figure out what the right thing is to do and how to get there. And, uh, and, and when is the right time to share information? So overall, like the key learnings from all of this stuff should be, hopefully, that number one, you need to prepare as well as you can and make friends with the people you're gonna be working with. Get to know them, build trust, that is critical. 
Number two, timing is crucial. You need to pick the right time to share information and don't be overconfident in what you share. Like, really think about what the right information is at the right time. It's okay at the beginning to acknowledge that something's happened and say you're looking into it and you'll come back. That's okay. What is not okay is to just be silent or to go out with something like really bold that ends up not being accurate. Both of those things will bite you and the press will come after you for it. So, like, think about it quite carefully what you share and when. Expect difficult questions and prepare your team to answer those, whether it's your like core stakeholder team, your execs, or the broader team. You're going to get those difficult questions, so be prepared for them. And your guiding principle in everything should always be to focus on those who are affected and think about how to make it best for them. And to end, here's a very angry, pissed off cat. <laughs> questions? Anybody? Kind of galloped through that. No questions? Ah, yes. Mr. Moore. Um, how do you deal with it when you're the back end for other service providers? So, like, let's say you happen to own a company called Log Entries. Okay. Let's say there are zero relationship with Log Entries itself, but other third parties <laughs> use you as the back end for their services. Like, does that change how you respond to their pricing? Yeah, I mean, definitely it complicates. So for those who can answer, hear the question, the question was, uh, if you are the back end for other services that are provided and you're dealing with an issue, um, it, it, it complicates the issue, right? Like, you then have a more complex disclosure. The reality is what you have to do is bring those service providers together and create basically like a mini council of them and make sure that you're managing the process through them very carefully. Like, again, it's difficult because in that situation, your control is spreading. Um, and one thing to remember is anytime you share information, it becomes a little, le little bit less secret, which again, I know, the right? Mm. Um, it's really obvious, but the reality is people don't necessarily get this and think about the fact that if you share information with a partner or a stakeholder, excuse me, or an internal um, stakeholder or whatever, like every time you do that, you erode the privacy factor. And so you need to be prepared before you share it with anyone that effectively you could be making it public now. So um, I just worked on a crisis response for a customer and their, uh, their situation was like very internally focused. It wasn't anything like a breach or anything like that. And they were communicating to their employees. And I said to them, okay, so we're gonna create a communication that's for the employees, but when we do that, we're also gonna create a public statement that we're gonna have like in our back pockets that we're not gonna plan to put out. But because you're communicating with 1,500 employees worldwide, the chances are it's going to get public. So at that point, you need to be prepared to make a public statement should people ask. So it's just better for us to have it and have it ready to go. Um, and so like, it's just that kind of thing. You, you'll have a more complex situation. You'll have to think a little bit more about what that process is for how to communicate with those people, and you're not gonna have the same level of trust and knowledge with them. You'll need to identify who the key decision makers are on their side very quickly and bring them into a council. And then, like, figuring out the cadence of communication and getting everyone on the same page on, on how you manage it. I don't see it as super different to when we do a coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Other questions? I mean, HD leading the way once again. Come on. I just love the cats. Because people are paying attention. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Well, thank you. So you love the cats? And we were forced to love cats. Um, as far as I can tell, this is what powers the internet, is cat pictures, so I feel like from now on all talks should just be cat pictures. At what point in time do you choose to involve third parties, whether it's a HIPAA, PCI compliance breach, or you know the, the big horrible Home Depot target kind of stuff, at what point, you know, stage one, stage two, stage three, what, when is that reporting happening? Is that before you go public, while you're going public? How does that stage work typically for you guys? Yeah, so um, great question. Uh, at what point do you involve third parties? Um, it really depends on the scenario, and I know that sounds like a cop-out answer, but it's the truth. Um, I would say as a basic rule, uh, once you have verified the situation, you don't need to like verify every detail, but you need to verify that the situation is real. 
Um, and then you build a basic plan. Um, you probably, depending on what the third party is, so like the example you gave where it's mostly regulatory authorities, you probably want to include them early because they will give you some level of counsel on what they expect from you. Um, but I would recommend that when you reach out to them, you have in mind some level of plan of what you want to communicate that you can share with them. Um, I think the other thing is, like, you want to communicate early with them, you, you want to be transparent, and you want to make it seem as if you're not trying to hide anything. But again, you don't want to over-communicate until you know details. It is okay to say to people, we are still actively investigating. We will share more information with you when we have it. As a follow-up onto that, how does Rapid7 or other companies like yourself, how do they deal with it when the client says, no, we don't want to report that? Um, no, well, no. So, um, so the way that we do crisis comms is we will do it as part of a um, incident response engagement. So we will be doing um, crisis communications as part of a general like response on a technical level as well. Um, ultimately, I can give advice, but I cannot force people to take it. Um, we worked last year with a company. Uh, that had a, a breach that they disclosed. And when I did my initial conversations with them, I gave them advice on the strategy that I would take, and they were not keen to take it. Um, and they had a lot of pressures internally that were coming from up the chain uh, that were based on um, business concerns around stock price and that kind of thing. And so they, they didn't want to disclose, and they were kind of hoping they would just kind of, it would just blow over. And theirs was a situation where the breach had been reported to them actually by a third party, party who had discovered creds for sale on the dark web. And so I let it go for a couple of weeks. I let them sort of think about it because they hadn't told me emphatically no. They had just sort of said probably not and then gone really quiet on me. And after a couple of weeks, I reached out to them and I just said, look, um, I understand that you're dealing with the realities of the business and there's a lot of things at play here, but I would be remiss in my duty of care to you if I didn't just sort of say that, you know, once again, this is the strategy I recommend and the bottom line for me is this. You discovered this because somebody else reported it to you. If one person can find it and trace it back to you, anybody else can. And if that happens, then you're going to have this breach disclosure get away from you and then it's out of your hands and you're reactive. So that is going to be much worse for your business and for the reputation of your business and the stock price and everything than if you proactively communicate. The thing that was interesting is they didn't acknowledge that email. Four days later, they disclosed. And so, you know, I will say though that in the same time frame, I worked with another company who, um, they called me and they wanted to go through a hypothetical situation. And I gave them my hypothetical response. Um, and they ignored it. And it was their choice to ignore it. And um, sometime later, they were forced into a disclosure situation. And the situation went out of their hands and blew up in their faces very, very badly. And, you know, that is the reality of the choice that they made, right? Like, it's a risk model like any other risk model. They accepted their risk tolerance was that they would rather play the hand and see what happened than be proactive about it. And as a consultant, all I can do is give them my best advice and, and let them make a decision based on, like, what they think is right for their business. Um, but, no, we don't, we don't drop them as a client. Like, we were still working with them on the, on the technical response. Any other questions? Do you have any strategies when you have two stakeholders that are in direct conflict with the process? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So that was, are there any strategies when you have two stakeholders that are in direct conflict? Um, so that's where I think that doing exercise in, exercise in advance and doing the workflows and the roles and responsibilities really, really helps. We actually had that problem at Rapid7. I mean, as I said, when I got handed that document the first time and I was like, wait, why is product marketing down as holding this? Um, it was because the head of product marketing thought that he should hold it. And so we had to have some like conversations about, 
you know, the realities of what that would look like. And in our case, the way that we worked it, I mean, firstly, we had a couple of situations that came up that were like sort of heartbleed type things. So not things where like it was really a company crisis, but still something where we had to like get a response together very quickly and figure out what the impact was for our customers and that kind of stuff. And going through those helped us to figure out who was more suited to do what in which situation and like actually practice through them. But the second thing is we just had to like in a sort of tabletop environment, in a live exercise kind of practice kind of environment, go, okay, well, if we take this approach, what is the logical conclusion? And if we take this approach, what's the logical conclusion? And obviously, in the end, I was right. Just saying. <laughs> That's why I'm on the stage and he's not. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, I think, like, do, making them, like, I think making them actually walk through it to the logical conclusion will help them to realize what needs to happen. And I think anything that you can do to build empathy, and, and I know empathy is a dirty word in this, in this community, but you know, um, anything you can do to help build empathy and trust is, is critical. Um, and you know, we, like when we had this issue recently with the, the customer that went down, um, I got a call straight away. That was a major departure. It used to be the case that you know the engineering team would call the security team, and then they would bring me in. And this time, it was like straight away, I was called. And now we have a really good relationship. And so all of us were on the call, and we we were doing these calls. Like we had this team that like some of them were in Dublin, and some of them were in um, Brazil, and like people were all over the place. And it was all different time zones, and we were doing these calls at ridiculous times. And we had this one call, and. <laughs> Uh, the head of security and the head of engineering got on the phone, they were in Dublin, and they were sitting in, in, in dressing gowns, in bathing robes, whatever the hell you call them in this country. Um, and they were like sat there in this hotel room sitting on a bed together in the, in the robes, and we're all on this video conference. And we all like start laughing at this. And we have this point where we're just like, how is it that we're going through a situation which is kind of shit, honestly, um, and we're doing calls at times of night that nobody wants to be on the phone, particularly when they're in Dublin, they're like six hours ahead of here. Um, and yet, like, we found a way to joke and laugh with each other through the process. And that's because we've got to a point now where we have trust and we have a lot of mutual respect. And so nobody was going to look at them getting on and be like, oh, you're not taking this seriously. Instead, we were like, this is what we needed. We needed, like, a little bit of break and a bit of, a bit of uh, levity. Any, any other questions? Oh, oh, my God, I can almost see you guys. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs>